This is Agua Latina on CJSR 88.5 FM. My name is DJ and DJ. You are listening to live music from the streets of your hometown. If you recognize the style of guitar that you're hearing, or if you know for certain you have heard this artist that busks in places such as White Avenue or Churchill Square, tonight you will get to learn about the man who sits on top of the amplifier and projects his unique compositions full of clarity and style over and above the often noisy soundscapes of the city we call home. Ari Volk makes his living as a busker, and tonight, in addition to great music, he will offer us some insights into the past, present, and his future hopes, not only for himself, but other musicians whose salary is earned by performing for Edmontonians. But before we talk to Ari, sit back, relax, and enjoy his music.
Wow, muchas gracias, Ari. Thank you very much, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, welcome to Agua Latina. Yeah. <laughs> and welcome <laughs> to here. CJSR. Um, so, I heard you busking a few days ago on my lunch break, and I had to approach you because I know I'm not the only one who wants to know more about the man who makes this vibrant music that we just heard. You have a technique and so many musical ideas going on. Can you tell us about that song we just heard? Well, a lot of what I do in composition uh, comes from the performance that I do on the streets. And it's sort of been developed to suit that environment. So I have melodies that I use as jumping off points and little phrases that I use to uh, sort of start myself or anchor myself. But the actual composition can stretch in and out depending on, you know, what what I need at that particular moment depending on who's watching or who's listening so it's uh, like that's a little piece in E minor and I have a few um, a few of my favorite little melodies in there and then I just work around that Does it have a title? <laughs> you know that, that's something that, <laughs> that I was actually thinking about literally three minutes ago before we went on air which is like oh god I don't actually name my songs. <laughs> what am I going to call them? I have no names for them. Um, they don't have associated lyrics, <laughs> so I've never think think of it that way. In my head, it's like that thing I do in in uh, in E minor with the the da 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 and the da da da. I guess I'll use that. And uh, <laughs> you know, I panicked a bit, but oh, yeah, no, that's how it is. And and for you, is that something that's that's liberating? Like maybe you don't. Maybe your songs don't need to have titles. Have you have you it, tried naming? It it certainly it certainly makes them more um, more usable. I, I think that people can take what they want from it. I think sometimes uh, lyrics and, and and titles, even album art, anything anything that's associated with the song puts a certain connotation on the music, and people are like, oh, I I need to get that from it or get that from it. It's like, yeah, yeah, you can use my music music for whatever you want you know take it take it as you will it's fine fine <laughs> um ari we communicated a little through email before the show and you mentioned you come from a musical family right here in edmonton can you tell us what it was like to have musical parents and how they influenced you to create the music like like what you just played for us okay um Growing up in an environment where you hear music as part of the the sort of daily ambiance of your life, it's just it's it's in the background at all times. I, it has benefits that I don't think you 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 ever are really fully aware of as a musician. Sometimes, like I'll be creating or I'll be playing on the street, and I'll find a pattern pops into my head, and I'll go, where did that come from? And maybe hours, days later, I realized that's something that I picked up years and years and years ago from listening to my parents play in that environment. And so I think that we, we kind of ignore the, the potential for, for passive learning. We ignore the potential for um, an artistically rich environment to nourish nourish creativity in people and I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that I grew up in an environment where there was Baroque music playing from my father or there was uh, you know classical from from piano from my mother. Whether I'm even fully aware of it on a conscious level or not I know now I've gotten far enough in my life that I know now that it, that it has had a definite impact on on forming how I perceive music and especially when you're at such a young age it's uh, your, your brain is still growing and your brain is absorbing so many patterns and so much at once and when you have these these good melodic rhythmic things to incorporate I think it just it sticks with you so it, it ta speaking of uh, speaking of uh, melodic composition I I know you've played guitar in other contexts yeah. and I have a bit of a I have a bit of a theory that 
guitarists get really fluent with the instrument when they look at it from a lot of different angles. How do you how do you conceive of like the the melodies and the harmonies you're playing as you're going along? Are you are you like a jazz guy? Are you thinking about modes? Um, like like how do you how do you cognitively get things going? That's that's a good question. Um, I always advise students that I teach to pick up a musical outlet outside of the guitar itself. And I always advise them to, if you have access to a stringed instrument like um, uh, violin or cello, anything anything fretless, that that's a good uh, good diversion from guitar and a, and, and a good place to develop uh, your musicality. Uh, guitar is so versatile and, and open-ended in that sense. Uh, personally, I use a lot of uh, violin uh, vi violin structures in my playing. I, I trace out melodies using uh, harmonies the way the vi a violin player would, and that sort of gives me anchor point. When you're doing a lot of lead work and you're doing a lot of fast, fast notes, fast, fast strumming, it helps to reference instruments that have been doing that type of playing for a for a much longer period of time, because the tradition of solo, uh, soloing on violin, violin solos goes back years, years and years and years, and there's a, there's definitely a lot to be learned there, yeah. Um, that's amazing, Ari. We have so much to talk about, and uh, we also, we also want to listen to lots of your music, so maybe I'll ask you one more question, yep. and then we'll, we'll hear another track, or we'll hear another... Um, <laughs> we'll hear something. A burst of joy. A burst. Uh, so what other musical styles have you played on the guitar? Well, in my formative years, I was copying mostly rock and blues stuff. And I think a lot of guitar players start at that point. It's familiar, it's in our hearing all the time, and it's, it's easy to pick up on, and it's rewarding because... You're, you're able to reproduce a sound that you hear all the time. I played, uh, oh, I was playing even Beatles riffs when I, when I started, but Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, all kinds of, kinds of rock stuff like that. And it's just so blues. Uh, what else? Oh, I ventured into just, <laughs> just about everything that you can imagine on guitar. I've done some metal, uh, jazz now and then. I don't consider myself a proficient jazz player but there's definitely, you pull inspiration from just about everything that you listen to, so. Well, I have, to, I have to call on you for being a little modest because last night I went down the rabbit hole that is uh, White Summer videos on YouTube. <laughs> and <laughs> Ari can absolutely shred on an electric guitar. And so he's, if you think he's playing fast now, it's not, it's, it, this is nothing that's new to him. But anyway, um, before we maybe maybe later in the show we'll play some some white summer. Uh, what do you want to play for us now, Ari? Uh, oh right, titles again. Oh, well, this part. Um, okay, well, let's do something in A minor this time. <laughs> Thank you. 
sitting on his amp playing music just like that Ari uh, thank you so much for that track yeah, absolutely I want to ask you an obvious question that I think a lot of the guitarists in town will want me to ask you oh good I love obvious questions <laughs> um, technique what have you done over the years that's helped you 
uh, break barriers and be able to play with that speed and have the synchronization between your your right and your left hand. <laughs> I I I'm a I'm a classical guitarist and I I think guitar is an instrument where it's pretty easy to let barriers stop you. So I'm just I'm just wondering what sort of methods have you had? You ever been searching if you if you're a guitar player and you play with a pick and you're watching some TV or something and you want to pick up your guitar because you got a riff in your head that you want to look through and you can't find a pick you end up just using your fingers that's kind of how I started playing playing finger style and I mean after that I, I began to research the the technicalities of, of, of the various you know permutations of finger style technique but uh, you, you have to be adventurous and there's, I think there's a lot of in, intuition in in, in in what I do when I'm when I'm practicing I just if it feels comfortable, go with it. Don't don't be too afraid to conform to, you know, the textbooks or professors or whatever say this and this and this, and your fingers have to be in 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 this posture and at a, this exact sort of sort of structure to it. That's not uh, it's not the be all end all. You have to adapt to what works for you. And sometimes I play from. If you're a guitarist, sometimes I play finger style from the, the first knuckle in a, in a more flamenco sense where you keep your fingers uh, stiff and straight and you come down on the string type quite percussively. Other times I use more of a claw technique where you're bending at the second knuckle and it's, and it's sort of plucking outwards. And it's just, it's always been whatever, whatever feels comfortable. Uh, tips and tricks for this sort of thing? Play with heavier gauge strings than you want to perform with and you'll strengthen your hands just like you would if you were lifting weights in the gym. Uh, it'll improve your legato immensely, it'll improve the, the, the fluidity of your playing if you build some of that muscle mass up. So if you have a practice guitar, maybe string it with a, especially if it's a steel string, a couple notches higher than what you would normally use. Um, other than that, it's all been sort of innovation and adventure. I mean, I've never had a formula or anything like that. Um, what, what guitarists have influenced your playing? <laughs> another, another very good, obvious sort of question. Um, oh, when I was 13 or 14 years old, Jimmy Page was the only person that I listened to, or the only person that I would believe had a say in determining my musical future. If, if Jimmy Page didn't approve of it, there was... <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing of value for me. But I got out of that phase, thankfully. Um, for this style of playing, people like Aldi Miola, Paco, uh, even, even, uh, even a bit of Ingwe, all, all have contributed to my perception of how you can be technically proficient and melodic at the same time. Uh, those are good guitarists to name, but any anything that I like, really, I will attempt to incorporate into what I play. If I hear a sound that I like, I'll go, okay, who is that? Who's doing that? And I'll learn about them and learn what they're doing. Um, I, I dabble in some finger style on electric, so even like a Mark Knopfler is relevant to me. I if you if you discount musical influences too, in, in too much of a discriminatory way, you really limit yourself. Uh, I think sometimes we're pressured into these holes as musicians where if you do this sort of thing, if you're a classical guitarist, you have to listen to only these classical guitarists. No, that's not, that's not where creativity comes from. You have to just allow yourself to embrace what you like. If you hear a sound and that is good to you, learn it learn where that comes from. Awesome. And uh, where I want to I want listeners to know where where you come from as far as the the mu the music you've made in Edmonton. We talked a little bit earlier about how you used to you used to open for for Jack Semple. Yeah. And uh, you, you used to play in bars when there were some slightly different AGLC regulations, is yeah. that right? Well, I was thankful that at the time that I started playing in rock bands, 
we were able to obtain permission to play in licensed establishments and venues all across the city despite being 14 or 15 years old all we had to do was submit uh, I think it was a, just a little form or we had to obtain some letter like 72 hours beforehand before the gig that said AGLC gives permission to this underage performer to be on stage in this licensed environment so we were playing bar gigs when we were 14 or 15 and I'm thankful for that because there aren't there aren't a huge number of opportunities for young musicians in Edmonton to sort of go out and perform in front of a public audience. I mean, you have your typical school stuff and school, you know, battle of the bands, but nothing that's that's consistent enough to actually be reliable. So I was thankful for that. And then they changed it. It was about maybe when we were 16 or 17, you were no longer able to obtain that permission to play in a licensed venue. And that did weird that did weird things to us as a band because all of a sudden we had no gigs. It was like, oh well, now what do we do? I mean, we were we were pretty serious for teenagers. We practiced three or four times a week, and there's no outlet for it. So yeah, um, we played hall shows as well. You don't see as much of that anymore. Uh, in the mid 2000s, there used to be a lot of hall shows that were that were organized. Uh, that's where Jack Semple came in. He was playing at Bonnie Dune Hall, one of the larger halls, and I don't even remember. I don't even remember how we got that gig, as some some word of mouth somehow. But he, <laughs> there was a fairly inspiring person to open for. Um, just his dedication. Just his dedication. You could see that this was a person that was very committed to living uh, a life of, of musicianship. Um, it, that, that was a personal connection for me when you mentioned that because when I was a kid growing up in Regina, uh, my brother took lessons with Jack and I remember being in Jack's basement uh, once uh, and it was so awesome to see him, him teach. And then I, I walked into a club once on a trip home and, and he was playing too. And when I, yeah, when I, when I listened to your playing, I think, you know, maybe Jack was, a, maybe Jack was an influence on you. <laughs> or maybe it was just that you're two guys with awesome work ethics on the guitar. I remember I was warming up backstage, and he came in to the uh, little, we'll call it a dressing room. It's Bonnie Dune Hall, so it's, that's a liberal use of the term dressing room, but it was, a, it was a place with four walls behind the stage. And he came in while I was warming up, and I remember him going out and saying to somebody, oh, i got to eat my Wheaties tonight. And that was like, that was one of the first major compliments I think I ever received, because it's like, oh, here's this guy who's like reasonably accomplished and obviously very technically proficient, and, you know, he noticed me, even if he's kind of joking about it, you know. It's like, okay, he sees something there, so take the positives from that. Good encouragement. Hey, let's hear another song. Would you, would you like to play... A little bit of music from the the rock band you were part of. Yeah, if you, if we can pull up that uh, that White Summer track, give people an idea of the the great distance that I've traversed in in coming to where I am now musically. Awesome. So this is a track called Thermopylae. Thermopylae. Yeah. It's about uh, about the stuff in Three Hundred. If you've seen the movie Three Hundred, I wrote this before the movie Three Hundred came out. Before it was cool. Yeah. 
Socialize, play some darts, and share some memories. Check out blackdog.ca for daily drink specials, event schedule, and more. And don't forget about Hair of the Dog Saturdays, presented by Big Rock Brewery. Live music, specials on Big Rock, and best of all, no cover every Saturday from 2 to 6. Dog may be man's best friend, but your Labradoodle can't pour a perfect pint. Black Dog Freehouse, located at 10425 White Avenue. Aria's Bistro offers a weekly program of live music as satisfying as its selection of fresh food and drinks, continuing the tradition of bringing new and established acts from its past incarnation as Chaw Island. This off-white hotspot at 10332 81st Avenue also prides itself on excellent sound, great service and atmosphere, plus an open mic with Garrett James every Thursday from 7 to 11. Coming soon to Aria's Bistro on October 26th, an open Open mic with Kaylin Kowalshin, while Evan Van Ramshorst and Back Current take the stage on the 27th, followed by Tyler Lazat on the 28th. Visit ariasbistro.com for upcoming events and more. Captain's blog, Space Date 420. We've just entered the Shell Shock Nebula, a spectacular system in the Cannabis Alpha sector on a most critical mission. Currently in search of supply ships in order to load the crew up with much needed stash jars, papers, incense and hemp moisturizers. Commander Beta is gathering intelligence through his keen navigation of shellshock420.com on our computer core. It seems the three ship's coordinates are at White Mud Crossing, White Avenue and 124th Street. Shellshock, engage. 
CGSR wants to remind you that driving while under the influence of drugs or alcohol is dangerous, be it to the driver, the passengers, or any bystanders. Please remember to make a plan of how to get back home before you leave using public transit, taxis, or a ride service app of your choice. Also, keep the weather in mind when dressing up for your night out. Plan ahead and stay safe. Edmonton, you're listening to Agua Latina on the mighty CJSR. I'm here with Ari Volk, guitarist, busker, Edmontonian. He's in the station, and Ari, busking is what we really want to get to tonight. How long have you been busking in Edmonton? About five years, five years steadily. Um, I dabbled in it a bit before then, so I'd say maybe seven total, but, but five years as, as a source of income. And we were talking about how busking has changed for you over the years. Could you, could you give Edmontonians sort of like, a, like your history of busking and how you've seen it change as, uh, as the Alberta economy has changed? And how how the environment has has, has just has just changed over the years, well, for better or worse. I know some people are going to get mad at me for saying this, but trickle down economics does work to a point. Uh, when when Edmonton was in an oil boom, um, when I first started, 2011, 2000, 2012, even into 2013. The, the, the cash that was flowing from the, the, the oil industry and from the rig workers was something that even I felt playing on the street. And when they would come, come back to Edmonton after a two-week or three-week shift and they'd want to let off steam and party, I definitely reaped the rewards and the, and, and, and the benefits of their success. And then as the economy fell that stopped happening as frequently. You stopped seeing those people who had that great success in the oil field and their, and their loose money. It just it didn't come the way it did. You'd get people would toss you, you know, multiple 20s at a time, and, it, and it, wasn't, it wasn't even a significant amount of money to them back then. They were just so successful and so everything they did was so profitable, and now that's not, that's not a thing. It's more definitely more of a struggle now than when, than, uh, when I started. So yeah, you definitely feel the, the overall status of the economy, even, even as a street performer or even as, as a musician that's just out there on White Ave on the weekends, you definitely feel it. I have a bit of a confession to make. Um, some people listening will like this, but I came to Edmonton in 2001 when I was 18 years old, and I was tossed in a few 20s too. Yeah. Which maybe explains, uh, maybe explains, you know, why I could use some more cash. But, <laughs> but um, oh, this is this is so interesting that you you know you acknowledge that that the that the economy has has really had really had that effect. And and like, could you give listeners an idea of like what are we talking? Like, would you say things have gone down like fifty percent, or is there is there a quantity you could sort of generalize? Quantifying this is something that's not easy to do because I don't keep, <laughs> I don't keep books. I mean, I, sh I probably should. At this point, I probably should, but I don't keep books. Um, guaranteeing myself the amount of money on an average Friday night that I would have made in 2012 takes me double the amount of time that I would in 2012. And even then, even then it's sketchier. Uh, yeah, that's about the only sort of quantification I can give for that. And, and um, as a musician, so w what other sort of differences have you seen in the busking climate? Um, I know we we spoke a bit a bit a little bit about attacks on busking from from city councillors, from uh, certain members of the business community. W what's your take on that? Okay, this is. This is the meat of the story here. This is what I wanted to get to. <laughs> um, the city has people that they view as problematic. They have certain people that 
utilize freedom of speech, utilize the streets in a way that certain city councillors would rather not see continue. And the, the street preachers that I think a lot of people are familiar with, because they're notorious and, and infamous in the city at this point, are kind of number one on that list of problematic people. There was a big attack that threatened my ability to make a living on the street that started in, I think the big push was in the first quarter of 2016. And the, the volume of complaints that the, that the street preachers receive is enormous. People tremendously dislike what they're doing and the way that they're presenting it. Um, my own take on it is that I believe in freedom of speech and I believe in freedom of expression. And I also believe that public nuisances should be dealt with on an individual basis. But the city was trying to establish a bylaw as kind of a catch-all to get rid of the preachers, because this was their number one priority, and they didn't really care who they hurt in the process by enacting this bylaw. They just wanted some type of legality that could take them off of the streets. And so there was a... Uh, a variation of a noise bylaw proposed which said that there should be no amplification allowed on city streets. Now, I don't think that everyone out there has attempted to play nylon string guitar on a busy city street before, but without some form of amplification, it is absolutely futile. It's a quiet instrument, and lots of modes of expression, lots of modes of musical and artistic expression are quiet and have any voice at all to be able to utilize that free spe speech and freedom of expression that we have from living in Canada. You have to have a degree of amplification. But they wanted to wipe it out completely in order to get rid of these, 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 these street preachers. Thankfully, some citizens stood up and the bylaw did not pass. It was very close to it, but it did not pass. And uh, dare I say his name on, on the radio, Mike Oshry was the city councillor who was the foremost proponent of that bylaw. He's gone now. That bylaw is gone. But the attacks continue. And White Ave is a central district for, for street performance and for buskers in, in Edmonton. And Edmonton doesn't have a lot of pedestrian traffic. We're a city that was built uh, after or around the invention of the automobile, so you don't have plazas and public squares and uh, marketplaces and walking distance sort of environments. So there are, the opportunities to bus and play in front of a public crowd are quite limited. So White Ave is one of the major places that we have. As you were mentioned earlier, I play downtown Churchill, a little bit on Jasper, and White Ave. The Old Strathcona Business Association has a, uh, or for, for this previous season, has had a pilot project going where they are attempting to impose a number of regulations upon street performers and buskers. And one of them that they're looking at is, again, this amplification thing. And I believe that musicians and performers should be respectful of noise bylaws. I believe that if you are deemed in excess to the point where you are getting complaints from the public on a regular basis, well, you're assaulting your own cause at that point anyway. You need to be pleasant enough that, 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 that people can take you in. But they want to take it beyond that. They want to take it beyond the city, city bylaw for noise, and they want to limit amplification altogether. Imagine... A classical pianist renowned for 30 years of, of performance wants to come down to White Ave and just ha have some fun and, you know, maybe make a little cash, just play, play on the street. You can't hear classical piano or anything on piano if there's no amplification. You're going to drag a grand piano down to White Ave to perform? No, you have to have a keyboard and you have to have an amplifier. You can't hear me because you can't hear a nylon string guitar when you have uh, sirens and just the sheer volume of, of vehicle traffic is immense and then you add to that yelling people and I, there's, a, there's a grand hypocrisy in it too because with the Oilers making the playoffs for the first time and this whole ice district project that the city has now the kind of gentrification of downtown there is a, a, a grand 
hypocrisy in the way that they're addressing uh, civic issues and rights issues. The Oilers playoffs create ridiculous amounts of noise, ridiculous amounts of noise. People are cheering and honking horns until three in the morning and, you know, it's like, okay, it's city pride and that's cool. But for them to then target someone like me who's playing nylon string guitar and saying that you're violating a noise, you know, noise bylaw and we're going to limit it. No, that's, that's disrespectful to a degree, to a great degree, actually. So we're all keeping a watch on what happens with that old Strathcona situation. We're hoping that their pilot project doesn't take off in the way that they want it to. I don't even know if they have the true legality to enforce the things that they want to do. I don't even, I don't even think they do. But it's, it's, it's discriminatory to, to a degree. And like I said, yes, sometimes you do get performers out there which are in excess of an acceptable volume. It's like, okay, yeah, that's, that's too loud, that's annoying. You can hear it blocks away, people are trying to sleep. But they should be dealt with on an individual basis. They should be giving warnings and then, you know, have permission to perform revoked after X number of warnings if they're not willing to moderate their volume. But it's kind of a draconian totalitarian m measures that they're taking that just takes the good with the bad. Because to, to come full circle, they want to get rid of those problematic people and... They just want bylaws in place that gives them the legality to, to do that without, without care or concern for who, who's affected by it. So Ari, how can, uh, how can you mobilize uh, thinkers that agree with, uh, with your ideas that, uh, that, uh, that some sort of ban on amplification altogether would be wrong? Like how, can you, how can you raise that to, to Edmontonians? Because uh, I, I never heard about this struggle before, and I, I certainly would have wanted to add my voice to it. Yeah. Um, I talk to everyone that I get the chance to talk to. Obviously, I interact with the public a lot because I'm out there performing all the time. Um, I've talked to a lot of police officers about it, and they agree with me. They agree with me that you know some type of moderation should be allowed for the extreme cases, but that over-regulation is just not necessary, it's just futile and that you're taking more of the good with you than, uh, than you are eliminating the bad. I talk to anyone that I get a chance to talk to, I tell them tell about the situation. Some people listen, some people, some people pass by. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know if this, is, if this is worth asking, but have you ever spoke to the street preachers about, about the effects of I of have. what they're doing on, what do they say? I have, and I've gone up to them and I've said, you know that we're just artists out here and we're trying to make a living and we're just trying to be successful to whatever degree we can achieve. And you, you guys are t putting a lot, of, a lot of negative pressure on us and, you know, we don't, you don't, you're creating a sinking ship and we don't want to go down with it. And they're not amiable to that. They firmly believe in, in, in what they're doing. They firmly believe that they have the right to continue doing it. And to an extent, I do as well, because I do, I do believe in, in free speech. And I may hate the way that they present their message, but I think it is very important that they are allowed to present it. It's, if you start to put limits on who can speak in public with, uh, with the microphone, where does that end? What happens when it's something really important and political that people need to be on the street protesting all the time, and all of a sudden there's a bylaw in place that says your voice can't be heard? That's, that's scary. Well, Aria, I find your patience uh, really commendable, and, and thank you very much for bringing this up to CGSR, because I think our listeners... Um, I think this will it will resonate with them. We're a local radio station. We're close to White Avenue. We're hearing buskers. Uh, Agua Latina uh, loves your music. And um, uh, speaking of music, can we can we hear another song? Yeah, absolutely. Let's go.
guitar and CJSR. Thank you, Ari. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so now, Ari, you, you do some teaching, is that that's right? Uh, I do teach, yeah. Uh, at some point, people started coming up to me and asking for lessons, so I've sort of made that into, uh, into a thing, and I've expanded my own, my own knowledge to be able to do that to the, uh, to the best of my ability. Um, anyone who wants to can find me on Facebook, Ari Volk. Uh, I'm quite visible. There's a guitarist page and a personal page. They're both Available, A-R-I, uh, space V-O-L-K is my full name. So if you would like to have instruction, I am available, especially especially in the winter season. It's much qu more quiet for me, and I have a lot, of, a lot of time to dedicate to that sort of thing. Right, you mentioned November is kind of a quiet month for musicians, so... November is a dead month in general. There's not, not a tremendous amount going on. It's in, in between holidays, it's the start of the cold season, it's... it's dark, people stay at home. It's not a great month for the arts in general. So it's a perfect time uh, out there, you guitarists, who, uh, who want to learn some, who, who want to learn some licks. Hey, um, Ari, yeah. what about uh, listeners who just really enjoy your music? How can they listen to it? They can come, <laughs> well, for about another week until it gets too cold, they can come find me on, on, on White Ave on the weekend or downtown during the days. Um, I've been, I was, a little bit negligent in that I don't have a lot of this style of music recorded. I've gone through a lot of stuff in my life and I don't have this style of music recorded. There are videos of me on YouTube that people have taken. Um, if you type in, type in my name, they are out there and they exist. But otherwise, you have to find me quite directly at the moment. Oh, well, that's what we'll, we'll just have to do. And it, uh, our time has uh, expired for the evening. Ari, thank you so much for coming. Oh, my pleasure. Um, there's just going to be a brief pause here, but don't go anywhere, folks. Up next is Edmonton's only Persian radio show. You've been listening to Agua Latina on CJSR with Ari Volk. Ari, thank you so much. Thank you. That was good. Oh, man. You made a big sound at a key place, but... No, I don't think it did. I think I can edit that out. I'm not sure. I don't think, I don't think it did. Oh, yeah. It made me jump on the bed, but I'll get it. I can edit it out. Well, my goodness gracious. Let's see, I can turn all these off now. And he has improved.